Hi, my name is Paul and welcome to Physics High. And today I'm going to give you an introduction to the oscilloscope. But before I go on, I'm going to give you a quick experiment to show you the power of the oscilloscope. I'm going to measure the speed of sound as it travels through this metal rod here. I have two transducers or piezoelectric transducers that will generate a small voltage if this vibrates. And I've got it connected to the oscilloscope. And when I strike this end here with this metal ruler is I'm going to cause a slight voltage occurring over here. The oscilloscope is going to start measuring. It will then also record the vibration of my second transducer. But because there is a delay between the start and the receiving of the signal at the other end, I should be able to work out the time delay. So here you can see the trace. My yellow trace is the signal starting. That's the top transducer here. At the other end, we're separated by one meter, I have the green trace, and if you look carefully, there is a delay between the two traces. That's the time difference. That is the time it takes for the sound wave to travel from one end to the other, and then all I now need to do is to work out what that time delay is. Well, this oscilloscope allows me to do that very easily. So I've got here 344 microseconds, because it's separated by one meter, and I'm going to get a value of 2,900 meters per second. And that is roughly in the right ballpark of the speed of sound as it travels through this metal pipe. That gives you the power of the oscilloscope. But let's start right from the beginning and how does it work? So stay tuned. Now, what is an oscilloscope? Now, an oscilloscope is pretty much what it says it is. That is, it is a scope, something that you can look at and measure. And secondly, it is something that oscillates, that in other words, moves backwards and forwards. And in essence, an oscilloscope is something that measures oscillations. And in this case, our oscillations are actually oscillations in terms of voltage. Now, there are basically two types of oscilloscopes. There's the analog oscilloscope and the digital oscilloscope. Now, the analog is often referred to as the crow or the cathode ray oscilloscope. And I'll discuss how that works in a moment. The digital oscilloscope produces its image or trace quite differently, but in essence, how they actually take the data in or the signal in and how it is actually used is going to be very similar. The thing is that the digital oscilloscope will have a lot of extra features. It has greater precision to give you digital regels, so much more precise measurements of various signals, but also you can do a lot more analysis of the data as well. I'm going to concentrate on the analog one because of the fact that it's quite simple and as a result it gives you the basics. You're going to find it here as well and more. Now with an analog oscilloscope we are in essence deflecting an electron beam or a cathode ray, hence it's referred to as a cathode ray oscilloscope or a crow for short. Because it's an electron beam, I can deflect it by electric fields, which I can apply either in the horizontal with plates or in the vertical with plates. Now, I can do this manually, which is by simply changing this position dial here, and I can move them horizontally like so, and I'm in essence actually applying electric field to my electron beam, and I do the same for thing for the vertical as well. Now, that's pretty boring because I want to have input a signal. Now, a signal is going to be going basically backwards and forwards, generally speaking. It's an oscillation, and so we have an oscillation that I can apply in terms of a voltage, which I'll do in a moment with this signal generator. But I want to trace that with respect to time, and so I can therefore cause an oscillation in the horizontal by this time. Now, you'll notice that both the volts and the time have a series of numbers. What do they do? Well, in terms of our grids that you can see both in the digital and the analog, it tells you what each of those divisions is equal to. So currently, I've got my voltage here at point two. That means each of those divisions, each of those larger squares here, is equivalent to point two volts. Of course, if I change dial, I'm changing what we refer to as the gain, and it actually becomes more sensitive. And again, I'll show you that in a moment. Up the top here, we have the divisions horizontally, and in this case, it's, I'm going to set it at 0.5. Now that means when this I turn this on to 0.5, it means that this dot will move 0.5 seconds from one division to the other. And so you can see it's now moving across. Now that is particularly slow, and in a moment I'm gonna add 500 hertz, so in this case it's not gonna be particularly useful. But you'll see it will become very relevant. Now, 
I have now a voltage input that I'm going to have on here in a second. I also have a time going left and right. I'm gonna be changing that in a moment to a much greater rate so that eventually what we get is not a dot, though it is a dot moving across the screen, but for us it now appears as a line. There's a couple of things you need to do before you actually make get a good signal. And that is, there are two particular positions that you need to actually place to get a correct dial. You'll have this variable dial here. You wanna make sure that's sitting here on the calibrate section, which is like this, it'll click in position, okay? The same here is for the volt. So you'll see that there's this calibration dial, it turns here, but you wanna make sure it clicks into place and you'll do that for your second channel as well. Now, the third aspect we need to be aware of is our trigger. Now, a trigger is ensuring that the signal is going to trace exactly the same path as it goes backwards and forwards multiple times. And in this case, because our source is in channel 1, we want to make sure our trigger is going to be also with channel 1. Now we're ready to turn the actual signal on. And in this case, I have a signal that is at 500 hertz. Now you'll see I get a lovely trace here. And that trace is consistent with the 500 hertz. Now at the moment, the volume is such that I'm getting a certain voltage here, which I'm now able to measure. I'm going to read from the top and the bottom of my crest in the trough and then divide by two. And so I get one, two, three, four and I get about 4.6. Now 4.6 divisions divided by two is 2.3, and according to this, I have 0.2 volts. So 2.3 multiplied by 0.2 gives me my 0.46 volts. So in other words, the voltage here is 0.46 volts. And if I increase, of course, the volume, I'm gonna increase the amplitude of my signal. Now what about the frequency and the period? Well, the period is the time taken from one to the other. So this is basically the top of the crest. So again, I'm gonna move my position to get an accurate position like so. And you can see I've got one, two, three, four sections there. Four sections according to my dial. This is reading 0.5 milliseconds. 0.5 milliseconds multiplied by four gives me two milliseconds. And two milliseconds is equivalent to 500 hertz. Again, if I change my frequency and I'm going to, let's say, change this to, let's say, 1000, and you'll see my signal now becomes half the period as a result. So that's one particular wave, but let's have a look at two waves. And I can show two waves because I have two channels here. And in this case, I have a second signal that is exactly the same frequency. So if I show you that, I can change this. This vertical mode shows us our other second signal, and there it is. And in this case, it looks a different size. Now, there could be two reasons. A, their voltages are different, or B, my dials here are at different settings or different gains. Now, in this case, I've got both of them at 0.1, so I actually have one at different voltages. And I'm gonna actually change it so they're exactly the same. So I'm gonna, increase that one to five and then I'm going to change my gains in both cases and now they should be exactly the same. So here's channel two, there's channel one, you can see they're exactly the same size now. Now what I want to do is just want to show both and I put this two down, you'll see two lines there. I can change the positions on my dial so they are actually sitting one below each other and you can see they're in phase at this stage, exactly in phase. Now this is where the beauty happens. What happens if I want to see the summation of that? Well, the oscilloscope allows you to do that. So in this case, in order to see the summation, I just change this to add. It goes off the scale. I want to be able to see that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change the sensitivity of both of them so that they're both a little bit less. And so you can see the add is going to be sitting there. Now, what if would happen to my addition if I change the phase between these two waves? They're currently in phase, but what if I change them to be 180 degrees out of phase? And hey, presto, I get a straight line. In other words, they cancel out. Now, obviously I can have them at different frequencies as well as phase. And so in that case, I'm going to show both waves. Let's have, let's say, back at the same phase at the moment. And now let's change my frequency of one of them to let's say 800. 
You can see it has a different frequency and now I can add them and as a result I get something that's a bit different. So you can see the power of an oscilloscope. You can analyze the signal. Now in this case the triggers are automatic. This is automatically sending a signal and because both signals are basically generated at the same time, whether I use channel 1 or channel 2, it doesn't matter. The signals are going to be exactly the same. I can do this with my digital oscilloscope as well. I'm not going to demonstrate it because, well, A, there's a lot of buttons to push around to actually get the signals. It can be fairly quickly done, but each particular manufacturer has slightly different uh, sequences in terms of the buttons. And so, nonetheless, you can work that out yourself. But in essence, it's exactly the same. We have our horizontal scale over here. We have our input of or channel one here where I can change the voltages. And using this math button over here, I can actually cause this to add, but I can also subtract it, which the analog can't do. I can also multiply it, which the analog can't do. And I can even do what they call a fast Fourier transform. And some of you may know what that means. If you don't, don't worry. But then again, it's something that the digital oscilloscope can do for us. And I want to show you another example and actually highlight something about triggering. And in this case, I'm going to be using the concept of Beats. Now beats I have a video on and I encourage you to have a look at that my video but in essence if you have two different frequencies and they are separated by let's say a small number so let's say 500 and 501 then the frequency of the beats in other words the changes in amplitudes is the difference between those two and we're going to see that. So I've got here again 500 hertz in both my channels and now what I'm going to do is in channel A I'm going to make this 501. And what you'll notice now is that one is moving across the screen and one isn't moving across the screen. And why is that? Well, that has to do with this trigger. And at the moment, this is triggering according to channel two. In other words, it's staying stationary and copying basically the triggering based on channel two, but not channel one. And so as a result, because this is a different frequency for channel one, as a result, it's not going to be exactly the same. The trace is actually tracing once and then doing a slightly different trace on the way through. And that gives the appearance of the fact that it's moving from right to left. If I change trigger to channel one, you'll see the reverse happen. You can see now that channel one stays stationary and channel two now goes in the opposite direction. Now, that's not a problem for our looking at beats because what we want to do is to see both and we want to now add them up. And if I add them by placing this over here, you can see now we have this fluctuation going on here. You can see that there's a change in amplitudes. And so what we get is a loud soft changing. And as a result, that is equivalent in this case to one hertz. Again, I can do all this with my digital oscilloscope. The digital oscilloscope has a number of benefits over the analog oscilloscope. The first one is obvious. The fact is that I have greater precision. As you saw my example right at the beginning, I can actually make very precise measurements rather than just reading the grids off the square here. Secondly, I can, or as I've mentioned already, I can do other calculations when I'm comparing one signal against the other. But there's a few other nifty features as well. For example, there's an auto scale. In other words, it reads the signal and it develops the graph that is, it thinks it's best suited for. Of course, you can adjust it if you like. You can obviously save signals and save images for later use. Now, in terms of the triggering, and both of them were going to be on automatic, I can actually cause, of course, both to trigger based on events like I did with my piezo electric crystals. But the fact is, is that this doesn't save the final signal. You'll see the signal based on trigger, but then it quickly dissipates. And so you have to repeat it multiple times to be able to see it correctly. Whereas this, that image can be saved. And of course, we saw that before. So that, in essence, is the oscilloscope. Hopefully that has been helpful for you. If you have an oscilloscope or access to an oscilloscope, I encourage you to play with it, get something signal, whether it's a microphone or a signal generator or anything like that, and play with it and get familiar with the actual uh, knobs and dials and settings and so forth. As I said to you earlier, digital telescopes uh, are produced by a variety of companies, and although they have similar features, they will have their own little idiosyncrasies in terms of how they function. My name is Paul for Physics High. Please like, share and subscribe and put a comment down below if the video has been helpful for you. And please consider supporting me via Patreon as I endeavor to produce high quality physics videos. And I want to particularly thank these supporters. My name is Paul from Physics High. Take care and bye for now.